Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Mackey and you are watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. Twice per month I host this show where we discuss common pediatric health topics with top experts from Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota. Today we are discussing airway abnormalities in infants and children with our guest Dr. Karthik Balakrishnan. Dr. Balakrishnan is a pediatric otolaryngologist with special expertise in complex airway reconstruction in children. He is the Chair of Quality for the ENT Department at Mayo Clinic, and he also has leadership roles on multiple national medical societies. He is also the lead of the fetal airway team here at Mayo Clinic Children's Center, performing fetal airway management during fetal procedures or fetal surgeries and exit procedures. He is also an assistant professor of otolaryngology. Please join our conversation today by sending in your questions and comments under the Facebook Live video stream, and we will try our best to get to them during the live video broadcast. Dr. Balakrishnan, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks so much for having me, Dr. Mackey. Thanks for coming back, especially since we, we did have a, a short conversation before, but today mm -hmm. we're going to get into more of those complex um, airway abnormalities and all mm -hmm. the amazing procedures that you are doing to help kids breathe better. No, I appreciate the chance to come back and talk about it. Can you tell me a little bit how you got interested, especially in these complex airways? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I always had an interest in pediatrics, and um, I think airway surgery is really interesting because we get a chance to work with a lot of different specialties mm -hmm. and a lot of different colleagues in surgical and medical fields, and it's really sort of a high-impact thing we can do for these patients. Absolutely. Yeah. So you are dealing with the very complex um, changes that are happening in these airways, but let's start mm -hmm. by understanding the basic anatomy of a child's mm -hmm. airway and yeah. maybe how it differs a little bit from adults because there are, I think, some subtle differences. Absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely right. There are very important differences. So the really important differences are that the airway is, of course, smaller, mm -hmm. and we know that even small differences in airway size can really have huge effects on how much work it takes to get air to flow through. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be much more significant in children because they're already starting out small. Yeah. Um, it's like breathing through a little tiny, tiny straw, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. It's like a coffee straw. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of it. And then part of it is just the way children's chests are shaped and the way their lungs function. They're a lot more dependent on being able to move that air through, okay. perhaps, than adults are. Uh, and so that makes a difference, too. And then, of course, when you have children who have other problems like heart problems and neurologic problems that can just compound the whole situation. Absolutely. So you're working with all these different areas. I'm guessing, you know, mm -hmm. cardiothoracic surgery and um, anesthesia and mm -hmm. multiple different areas, especially Absolutely. in kids with other conditions that go compound it. Absolutely. So for a child that um, maybe has something wrong with their airway, what kind mm -hmm. of signs or symptoms should a parent look for um, that would suggest that there's something, something going on in the structure? That's a really important question. Um, a few things. So noisy breathing is a common symptom uh, mm -hmm. that we see. And um, so the classic term that we use for that is strider. It just means squeaky or raspy breathing. Um, a lot of times with that, children can work harder to breathe. So they might suck in up above their mm -hmm. breastbone or under their ribs. Mm -hmm. um, and when it gets really bad, sometimes they'll actually turn blue or stop breathing. Wow. Yeah. Okay. What other things would parents see besides strider? Sure, they can see voice problems. Okay. So depending on the specific laryngeal or voice box problem that mm -hmm. might be present, uh, the child might be hoarse or not have a voice at all. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, they might see feeding problems because it's hard for children to eat when they can't breathe. The other problem we see is that sometimes children won't grow because they're either not eating well or they're working so hard to breathe that they mm -hmm. burn all their calories that mm -hmm. way. Does that make a difference in when you're timing your interventions if a child's not growing well? Absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah, sometimes we have to do things to stabilize them and help them get their nutrition better before we can fix the problem. Okay, and those are some of the yeah. symptoms as a pediatrician that I'm looking for in the office, mm -hmm. right? A child's not growing well, loud breathing. Mm -hmm. I'm sending them to you to help us figure out what's going on. Exactly. Okay, yes. what are some of those things that can be going on that are a result of the loud breathing that mm -hmm. complicate their, their breathing pattern? Yeah, the, you know, the most common reason, and we see a lot of children for this, is a condition called laryngomalacia. Yes, which is, yes. You know, you're very familiar with yeah. as a pediatrician. And it's when the top of the voice box is just floppy. Okay. And so when the child is trying to breathe in, they get basically the top of the voice box sucking in like this. Mm -hmm. And it can cause noisy breathing and feeding trouble and so on. Um, that's very common. And then there are obviously less common but more dangerous problems that we come across too. And those are, are going to require a lot more extensive interventions, I'm guessing. Potentially, yeah. Okay. Yeah. With the laryngomalacia, most of the time, are you able to just watch that, or are there interventions mm -hmm. that you need to do with that? It varies. Okay. Um, about 40% of children will never need any intervention. Okay. 
Uh, another 30 to 40 percent might just need a little bit of medication, mm -hmm. uh, and then the rest uh, will need surgery. But it's a fairly straightforward surgery to do. Okay. So let's move on to talking about some of those more complex uh, con uh, problems that we see in the airway. Um, let's start with something called stenosis. Sure. What is the stenosis of the airway? What does that mean? So stenosis is just the medical term for narrowing. Okay. That's all it means. So mm -hmm. your airway, your windpipe is a, literally a pipe. Mm -hmm. um, and if the pipe is too narrow, then it's hard to breathe. Okay. And that's going to present with what kind of symptoms? Um, so... If it's mild, mm -hmm. sometimes it's just a little bit of noisy breathing or shortness of breath with activity. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll see kids slowing down or taking a break more than their peers okay. or having some noisy breathing there. Um, sometimes you can see, even with a mild stenosis, that they have more trouble when they get sick if they have a cold. Okay. If it gets really bad, then they have constant noisy breathing. They can have a lot of trouble with any physical activity, mm -hmm. um, feeding, and so on. It puts a lot of stress on the child. Okay, so if there's a stenosis in the airway, will it always present in early infancy or can it become problematic later in their childhood? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, it totally depends. So okay. some children are born with a significant enough stenosis that mm -hmm. it presents very early in life. Okay. Um, but we also know that babies are very tricky. They're good at hiding mm -hmm. bad things. <laughs> they are, <laughs> yes. Um, so sometimes it doesn't present till later. And then there are some kinds of stenosis that can develop over time and present even in the teenage years or later. Okay. All right, and we'll get to maybe one of those cases here in a second. So uh, let's talk about a specific case that we have. Can mm -hmm. you um, can you lay the groundwork for uh, the stenosis that you had of the trachea um, yes. in this case? Absolutely. So this was a young man, a teenager, a very, uh, very um, upbeat, kind of amazing young man who had a progressive condition called Morquio syndrome where his body just deposited abnormal substances in the tissues of his body, okay. basically. And it caused spine problems and uh, blood vessel problems and all sorts of things. But mm -hmm. one of the things it did was it, his body deposited all this stuff in the wall of his trachea. Okay. And over time, it caused a really bad narrowing of his windpipe. Uh, so by the time he got to us, uh, he not only had significant spine problems so, and so on that needed mm -hmm. treatment, but he had a lot of trouble breathing, even with the least little bit of activity. Okay. Yeah. So what was the inter intervention that you planned for him? So it was um, very complicated yeah. <laughs> because he had the heart issues and blood vessel issues. He had spine problems that needed to be fixed and the trachea problem. Okay. So we worked really closely with Dr. Duraney from the cardiac surgery team, mm -hmm. Dr. Besh from pulmonology, Dr. Stans, and Dr. Fogelson from the spine team uh, to kind of coordinate a plan. Okay. And so what we ended up doing was Dr. Stans and Dr. Fogelson ended up fixing his spine mm -hmm. first. Okay. And you can kind of see that here. This is a three-dimensional model of our patient. Yeah. Um, and this is the front and the back, the bottom of his head, spine. And you can see these purple rods that they put in to mm. fix his spine and straighten it. Okay. Um, so we actually had them do that first okay. because it made it a little safer for us to do the tracheal surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what we planned to do was go through his chest, put him on a bypass machine so we could move his heart out of the way, and then remove the bad part of the trachea and put it back together. Okay. So kind of taking out that stenosis, the mm -hmm. stenotic area. Exactly. I think we have some pictures of this. Yeah. Should we take a look at what it looked like before the surgery? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So what are we seeing here? Yeah, so this is a picture of this young man's windpipe. This is below the vocal cords, and normally the windpipe should be wide open and circular. <laughs> wow. And I think the audience can see here yeah. that instead it looks like it's totally closed off. Absolutely. Yeah. What about from, uh, let's take a, a look from a CT uh, cut here. Yeah, so this is a, a CAT scan, um, and this is him lying on his back, taking a slice through his chest like a loaf of bread. And those two big black circles are near the tops of his lungs, and uh, hopefully the audience can see in between the two, there's a little slanted black triangle. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, part of the narrowing. That Normally the airway should be much larger, and there you can see it's very narrow. Okay. As compared to, let's go to the next uh, CT4. Mm -hmm. Is that what his airway was supposed to look like? Exactly okay. right. So here's a little higher up in his airway above the narrowing, and you, you guys can see that there's a sort of a horseshoe-shaped black space that's dramatically bigger. Wow. Um, so after you took out that stenotic area mm -hmm. and then reattached the, the trachea back together, mm -hmm. um, what what was his future like after that? What did it, what kind of improvements did he have? So immediately, basically, as soon as we took the breathing tube out after the repair, yeah. he said he felt hugely better. Wow. Um, and he's continued to feel great. He's active. Mm -hmm. He 
he's gone hunting, he's gone, uh, done all kinds of activities that he enjoys, uh, and he has really felt much better. And I think part of it was because this came on kind of slowly over a few mm-hmm. years, mm-hmm. he didn't realize how bad it was okay. until it was fixed. That's a, it seems like a similar pattern with a lot of chronic diseases, right? Mm-hmm. They You just come adapted to, to what you're dealing with. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So I think we have another picture, an endo picture of what he looked yeah. like after. Okay, describe to us what we're seeing here. Yeah, this is so a lot different. A lot different, yes. Yeah. So this yeah. is his windpipe about three months after the surgery. Wow. And the audience can see now it's wide open. Okay. Um, Right in the middle, there's sort of a whitish ring. That's mm-hmm. where that, where we sewed his trachea back together, and wow. that's where it was totally closed off before. Wow. Um, so now it's nice and open. He can breathe pretty comfortably, and uh, things look good. He was healing nicely. Okay. So it, his um, stenotic area was in his trachea. Correct. Can you see stenosis in other areas as well, mm-hmm. other the breathing areas? You definitely can. Okay. So you can see stenosis... Um, Anywhere in the voice box, okay. so the top of the voice box, the level of the vocal cords, or just below. Mm-hmm. Um, and that area just below the vocal cords is the most common place. Okay. We can also see it lower down in what are called the bronchi, which are the branches mm-hmm. to the lungs. And this is that same young man's, another model of his windpipe. And you guys can see here, here's where the bad narrowing was. Wow. But these are the bronchi, the branches to the yeah. lungs, and those can be narrow as well. Okay. Yeah. Would they present with similar symptoms? Similar. Sometimes the noise is with breathing out. Okay. If it's down here and breathing in, if it's up here, but otherwise pretty similar. Okay. Yeah. If they're going to have like the subglottic area, so mm-hmm. below the, the vocal cord stenosis, mm-hmm. um, what kind of things would cause that? So many children are born with it. Okay. Um, that risk is higher in children with Down syndrome. Okay. Um, but the most common cause we see is from having a breathing tube in. Okay. Um, and we see that a lot now that... Um, neonatal ICU care has become so, so good, Mm -hmm. a lot of these children end up surviving, but they may have had a breathing tube in for an extended period of time, and that can do it. Okay. Um, What about vascular anomalies? Do you ever see that Mm -hmm. causing problems in the airway? Absolutely. That's that's a great question. So, um, yes, and this young man actually was an example of that, and it's a little hard to see on this model, but he actually had a very big blood vessel running across the front of his windpipe that was squashing it. Okay. That certainly didn't help. And, and we can see variations on that, what are called vascular rings or slings that can squish the trachea. Okay. Well, that kind of gets into our next area. So mm-hmm. other other types of um, another air anomaly would be some type of ring. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes it could be from an external structure and sometimes mm-hmm. it can be from internal yes. structures. Okay. Yes. Tell us more about that. So um, normally our windpipe is made of cartilage rings, but they're not actually circles. They're horseshoes. They kind of look like this. Okay. And so some children are born instead with full circles of cartilage, and that can cause a significant narrowing of the windpipe. Okay. Are are, are those children going to have any other symptoms that are going to be let a family know that that this is going on? The classic symptom is what we would call Darth Vader breathing. (laughs) What does that sound like? Or washing machine breathing. I I can't say I can imitate it perfectly, but it's sort of a (laughs) kind of noise. Yeah. And sometimes we see it right at birth with uh-huh. the severe narrowings. Okay. And sometimes, um, like in the patient we'll talk about next, she only really had it badly when she was sick. Okay. And she was always a fat, happy, healthy little baby. Awesome. Yeah. So not, not the symptoms you expect, failure to thrive, exactly. troubles breathing, things like that. Right. Okay, so in that was complete tracheal rings, mm-hmm. um, what kind of imaging or, di- or things are going to use to help that make that diagnosis? Yeah, so the most critical piece is uh, endoscopy, putting a camera in the airway to look at it. Okay. Um, but we also will get CAT scans. A lot of those children will have associated heart problems. Mm -hmm. So we'll get an echocardiogram and an ultrasound of the heart. Um, And so there's a variety of things we'll do to check them out. Okay. Are there any type of syndromes or genetic uh, uh, mutations Mm -hmm. that can predispose a a kid to having a complete ring? Definitely. So the risk is definitely higher with Down syndrome. Okay. Uh, It is also higher with uh, Apert syndrome and Cruzon syndrome. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we have some pictures of this. Why don't you mm-hmm. tell us about what we're seeing here? Sure. So this is a young child, the child I had mentioned earlier. So she was um, about eight months old uh, and, um, again, was a reasonably healthy child. But when she got sick, she'd have a lot of trouble breathing. Wow, I imagine. And uh, so when we looked at her trachea, um, what we found was this is looking just below the vocal cords. And the audience can see that it's a perfect circle as opposed to being a normal horseshoe shape. Mm-hmm. And it's also very, very small. And so she had about a 2.3 millimeter airway or so. Yeah, and in a child her age, that should measure, that was about half of normal. Oh my uh, gosh. Or a little bit less than half. 
but had no symptoms in between her illnesses. No, That's uh, amazingly. And babies are just good at hiding things. Yeah. They're, yeah. Absolutely. So what, what kind of treatments are you going to perform for children that have these complete tracheal rings? Yeah, so the, you know, in some children, about 10% of children, we can just watch them. Okay. And even though they have the complete rings, they'll grow. Mm-hmm. And the growth of their windpipe will keep up with the rest of them. They do okay. okay. But we have to keep a close eye on them. Yeah. And children like this, that wouldn't happen. It was too severe. Right. So in that case, we do a, a procedure called a slide tracheoplasty. Okay. Um, which is, uh, when I explain it to parents, um, what I tell them is basically it's like we c- we cut the windpipe at about the halfway point of the mm-hmm. narrowing, and we fillet open the front of the windpipe on one half and the back on the other and slide them over each other. Okay. So it's half as long and twice as wide. Should we look at the, we have a video about this. It does, it's do a that. great grant demonstration. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. So here we have, we're zooming in on the baby's windpipe, which is that white structure, and there's the narrowing. And then what we do is we make a beveled cut through the windpipe and like I said, we slide it over itself so it's fatter and shorter. And with the windpipe, the length does not matter. It's only the width that matters. Okay. And will that continue to grow with the child? It does. We okay. do have to keep an eye on it. Okay. But they tend to grow well with the child, and the children tend to do very well once they recover from the surgery. Okay. Yeah. I think we have some CT cuts of mm-hmm. the, the little girl you were describing. Should we take a look at the yeah, CT yeah, one? Yeah, the, yeah. So um, this is an endoscopic picture about a week after we repaired her. And the audience can see that now... The opening is much, mm-hmm. much bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, and those white lines, that white V at sort of 4 o'clock and 9 o'clock, that's where we had put in the stitches to put the windpipe back together. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And we have another picture of her about a year and a half later. Mm-hmm. So I'm guessing you're doing continuous monitoring to make sure that this is holding up. Exactly. Okay. So we, we look at it. Um, you know, it takes, uh, it takes about a week to heal, and the child usually spends a few weeks in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And then we tend to look at them endoscopically, Every few months, you know, and then start to stretch it out as they do well. So about a year and a half later, things are wide open. The wow. windpipe is still growing with her. Um, the interesting thing about this child is she actually only had one lung, um, which made things a little more challenging. Okay. Um, but um, it just required a little bit different surgical planning and mm-hmm. treating her differently in the recovery. Mm-hmm. But despite that, um, she's done great. Awesome. Yeah. Do you have a 3D model of that one? I do. So okay. here is a life-size model of when we repaired that baby, and you can kind of compare it to the young man we talked about before. Wow. Um, there's a difference, obviously. <laughs> um, so this is the little baby's top of her breastbone, her collarbones, and her spine. And when we look from the back, um, hopefully this shows up on the camera there, this little pale blue streak here, that's her windpipe. So that, that's life-size at the time that we repaired it. Wow. So it was itty-bitty. Um, but that's why she needed the repair because she was already starting out small and it was even smaller than normal. Yeah. When you're repairing uh, the tracheal rings, are these mostly open surgeries or are these things you're able to do endoscopically? So that is a really great question actually because mm-hmm. things are changing a little bit. Mm-hmm. So when it's like this little baby we just talked about where it's a long segment, mm-hmm. that we still fix open. And usually if it's the lower half to one third of the windpipe, we okay. have to open the chest and put the child on bypass. Mm-hmm. If it's the upper half to two-thirds, we can actually do it through the neck. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a shorter segment or other kinds of stenosis, we can do a lot of those endoscopically through the mouth and wow. avoid external cuts. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, so another airway anomaly that you sometimes see is, is when the vocal cords aren't working mm-hmm. or they're paralyzed. Yeah. How does that happen? Um, a variety of ways. Some children yeah. are born with it. Okay. And the, um, and it's still a little hard to sort out how many of those children born with it are just born with it because that's how it is and mm-hmm. how many are due to birth trauma. Okay. Um, what but, kind of birth trauma would, would bring that on? So sometimes it can be forceps okay. delivery, but sometimes it can just be from the shoulder being stuck, shoulder mm-hmm. dystocia. Okay. Sometimes it can be from prolonged labor or okay. a variety of things. Sure. I'm sure it's hard to pinpoint exactly in most cases it or is. many cases. It is definitely. Yeah. And then in some cases it's due to You know, the child has a surgery that they have to have, like a heart surgery Mm -hmm. or a PDA ligation, something like that. And the nerves that control the vocal cords run into the chest before they come up to the voice box. And so sometimes those nerves can get stretched or injured during those surgeries. Okay. So what kind of symptoms will children with a vocal cord that's paralyzed Mm -hmm. present with? So we all have two vocal cords. And normally when we talk, they close. Okay. And when we breathe in, they open to let air through into the windpipe. Okay. And when we swallow, they close. And they do it all without us thinking about it, right? All without us thinking about it. It's automatic. So if the vocal cords are paralyzed, that's where we see trouble. So if one vocal cord is paralyzed, what we see is the child will have trouble swallowing. They'll choke and cough because they can't close. And their voice may be weak and breathy. Mm -hmm. But they usually breathe okay. Okay. They might have some mild difficulty. But 
if both vocal cords are paralyzed, they're in children, it's usually because they're, their palate is closed. Mm. So then the child can swallow well mm -hmm. and talk okay or make mm -hmm. a voice okay, but they have a lot of trouble breathing. Mm -hmm. I would imagine. So, so yeah. So yeah. How, how do you make this diagnosis? How do, how do you go looking for this? So a lot of it is by the history. Okay. But the way we tell for sure is we do what's called flexible laryngoscopy where we put a little flexible camera in the child's nose actually while they're awake mm -hmm. and we can watch the vocal cords move while they're crying or swallowing. Okay. Um, and that'll tell us for sure. Okay. Um, this sometimes, it sounds like it maybe could sound a little bit like, like laryngeal malacia. Mm -hmm. it, um, do, you, do you ever see a kind of a, a milder picture that could be confused with laryngeal malacia or not? For sure. Okay. Yes. Um, especially if only one vocal cord isn't yeah. working perfectly. Okay. Uh, it can definitely mimic laryngeal malacia. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that when we diagnose laryngeal malacia, mm -hmm. we do it the same way with that camera on the nose. Okay. So we can sort you it can out. You can see it all right then yes. and there. Um, are these likely to resolve on their own or are they always going to need treatment? Well, we know that children are more likely to recover function of the vocal cords than adults. Okay. So we give them a longer time. Sure. So we usually give them somewhere between one and two years to recover okay. before we do anything permanent to fix it. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, if the child has trouble, we can do what's called a vocal cord injection to try to improve their symptoms. Okay. What, do you, what are you injecting into the vocal cords? Varies, okay. <laughs> but it's usually a temporary material. Okay. Um, and depending on what the material is, it can last anywhere from one month to six months. Okay. Um, and we typically will use that for one-sided vocal cord paralysis where they just can't close. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're basically putting some filler in that vocal cord so it moves towards the middle so the other one can move and meet it. Okay. Um, it does not restore movement to the vocal cord, but what it does is it buys the child time to recover on their own. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So if you can't, if, if they need more than an injection, mm -hmm. what's the next step? That depends. Okay. Um, so if they have one side that's not yeah. moving and they're not closing, um, the definitive procedure that we tend to do is called laryngeal re -innervation. Okay. And what that does is we basically borrow a nerve from a different muscle in the neck and hook it up to the nerve that controls the vocal cord. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a really cool surgery. It's actually technically pretty easy and it's quick. It takes about an hour. Um, and it does not restore movement. We don't have anything that restores movement. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it it restores tone, muscle tone and bulk to the vocal cord. Mm -hmm. And that can have significant improvement for voice okay. and sometimes for swallowing as well. Okay. Yeah. So is there's nothing really that can restore the movement of that vocal cord, it sounds like? Mm, right now we don't have a procedure okay. like that, but hopefully we'll develop that. Okay, sounds yeah. good. I'm, I'm sure that it's, it's on the horizon coming with yeah. all these technical advances that are happening. Exactly. Um, what about the recovery time for some of these procedures? We didn't talk necessarily about that, especially some of these more complex, like the, the slide tracheoplasty. Yeah, it's, um, so the recovery is <laughs> variable. Mm -hmm. um, usually for complex surgeries like the slide tracheoplasty, if mm -hmm. we do it through the neck, mm -hmm. it's actually pretty easy. The child has a breathing tube in their airway for one night. Wow. And then they might stay in the ICU for about a week. Okay. And it's usually about another week in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But during that time, they can eat and drink. They can be up and playing and so on mm -hmm. once the breathing tube's out. Okay. If we do it through the chest on bypass, the recovery is a little harder. Um, and we usually tell parents to plan to spend at least three weeks in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But if they do well, they can go home sooner. Okay. Um, and there, the breathing tube can take a couple extra days to come up. But we do try to get it out within a couple of days if we can. Okay. What about the procedures that you're doing for stenosis? I suppose that varies on what type of procedure you're doing. but It does. So if we do an open surgery through the mm -hmm. neck, for example, mm -hmm. um, that one, if the child already has a tracheostomy, the recovery is very easy. Okay. Um, if the child doesn't, then usually there's a breathing tube in for about a week, but that varies. Um, there are some cases where we can do it endoscopically, like mm -hmm. we talked about, and there the recovery is often a lot easier because there's not a big external neck incision. Okay. And so um, those recoveries are a lot easier, there's less pain, and it's generally um, nicer for the child. Okay. Yeah. You, you mentioned your interest in the endoscopic, and I also mm -hmm. have read that you're doing some laser-assisted procedures. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so the laser is a great tool. Mm -hmm. um, we use it to treat stenosis. Okay. Because depending on the type of stenosis, you can actually just use the laser through the mouth to remove the narrowing wow. uh, if it's made of scar tissue mm -hmm. or something else. Um, we'll sometimes use it for things like vocal cord paralysis mm -hmm. or immobility, where we can make a cut in the voice box to make space to breathe. Um, and then we use the laser for a lot of other things, like if there are um, abnormal vascular tumors made of blood vessels in the airway, we can mm -hmm. use it for that. Uh, we can use it for 
certain types of other growths like papillomas, which are which are um, benign growths in the larynx mm-hmm. that come from a virus. We okay. use it for that. Um, and there's a wide variety of lasers. Yeah. So we can pick the right one for the job. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share with about some of these procedures and the recovery time or follow-up? Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah. absolutely. So um, one of the really exciting things that, uh, that we're doing a fair bit of now is what's called endoscopic laryngotracheoplasty. Okay. So this is a... So Traditionally, mm-hmm. if a child had stenosis or narrowing mm-hmm. at the level of the vocal cords, mm-hmm. either because they were scarred or not moving, or below the vocal cords and subglottis, you'd have to go through the neck to fix it. Um, but in a lot of children, we can actually do it right through the mouth, wow. where we make a small cut in the back of the voice box mm-hmm. uh, and then take a piece of cartilage from the rib and put it in there through their mouth to create space. And that can be really useful for situations where both vocal cords are not moving and mm-hmm. they can't breathe, or if they're scarring and there's breathing trouble. And the recovery there is much easier, and um, it's a technically fairly straightforward operation, and we've had really good success with that. Okay. What kind yeah. of um, the, these airway reconstructive procedures are you using the 3D printing on to help with your surgical planning? Yeah, you know, um, we're using it more and more. Okay. Um, you know, it, in ENT, it's become a big deal. I know our head and neck cancer surgeons will do it mm-hmm. for almost every patient they operate on. Wow where they have to do a reconstruction. Mm-hmm. For us, we tend to save it for when there's really complex anatomy. Mm-hmm. So either the bony anatomy, the blood vessels, something about the airway narrowing is unusual. And we have to, we need 3D details of the anatomy to guide us. Mm-hmm. And so this young man, for instance, was a great example where right. he had a very abnormal spine. His breastbone was at a weird angle. He had abnormal blood vessels. Mm-hmm. And we had to figure out how to get in there to work on that bright blue airway down in there. Wow. Um, This model was a great communication tool Mm -hmm. with our other surgeons, but also with the patient and his family. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. It really helped everybody to understand the steps we needed to take. Absolutely. Well, this has been fantastic. Do you have anything else that you wanted to add? How how do people contact (laughs) uh, and get in in touch with you if there are concerns? Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's... um, there's a couple ways. So mm-hmm. they're very welcome to ask their primary care provider, their pediatrician, family mm-hmm. practitioner to refer mm-hmm. them over to us. Um, they're welcome to look at our website okay. uh, or our uh, phone number for my office um, is 507-284-4382. Okay. And uh, we're very happy to see children with airway concerns at any time. And we make that diagnosis a priority and fit them in right away. Absolutely. And you also yeah. work in the Aero Digestive Clinic as well mm-hmm. at Mayo, right? We do. And see kids that have problems with breathing and eating, where mm-hmm. a lot of these kids are going to fall, fall in, right? Yes. And Aero Digestive is a great way to get everybody who might help care for that child in one place at one time. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This Thanks was for fantastic. having me. Was great. Uh, thank you, everyone who watched today. Join us for the next Ask the Mayo Mom on March 1st. Um, The director of Mayo Clinic Children's Center will be joining us. Um, His name is Dr. Randy Flick, and he is a pediatric anesthesiologist, and he's also the president of the Society for Pediatric Anesthesia. Um, We'll be talking about anesthesia in children and what risks are associated with it. Um, Please join the conversation, and feel free to send in your questions in advance. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful day.